Our time together is called A Call to Praise, and this teaching is going to be like a little different, and it's going to sound weird as I say this, but I'm not going to go into like great crazy detail on all this text. I'm going to be honest, I don't even have a lot of my own thoughts on this text, because I think this text, what we read in the Bible, um, can so often be confusing, and I feel like we don't always understand what we're reading, but I feel like this text really speaks for itself. So as we look at each of these things, I want you to go, how can I do this in my own life? That's a question we're going to ask this whole, how can I do this in my own life? What's the question we're going to ask? How can I do this in my own life? Yeah, keep that in your head, write that down, hear it, see it, read it. It's verse seven. It says, on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Very simply, why did he write what we're about to read? Anyone? It literally says it right there. Why did he write this? What? To, it says it right there, right before verse 8. To thank the Lord. It says it right there, right? And then what does he say? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name Make his deeds known among the peoples. He says, give thanks to the Lord. Guys, this is an act of worship. Giving thanks is an act of worship. Thanking God is an act of worship. It's an act of praise. But let me ask you this. When is the last time you actually thank God? Uh, and, and don't answer it out loud. But I want you to truly, truly think about it. And, and, and I want you to think about it in a genuine sense. Not when you sat down at the dinner table or the lunch table and said, God, thank you for this day. Like, no, that's just like, you do that without even thinking. When's the last time you truly, truly thanked God? Here's, here's a challenge that I want you to do as we say, hey, how can I do this in my own life? I want you right now, I'm going to just pause for like 10 seconds, and I want you to just start in your head naming things that you're thankful for. Not out loud, but in your head. It could be as simple as thank you that I'm in church. Thank you for my dog. Thank you that I ate lunch today. Th thank you for, that I woke up today. Thank you that I have breath. Thank you that I have a roof over. I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but I just want you to take 10 seconds right now to start thanking God. Now, some of you might have seen that that isn't even enough time. I was reading about this person. They're like a biologist of some sort or some sort of, I don't even know, science. And, and they began to start to thank God for different cells, different atoms, different parts of cells, different ways in which our body functions. And, and this lady came to find that she couldn't even begin to name everything that she was thankful for because there is so much to be thankful for. But we've got to understand, anything good that we enjoy comes from God. You understand, anything good in your life, anything good on this earth, any good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from God. And we should thank him for that. You ever do something nice for someone and they don't thank you? You ever hold the door open for someone at like a place and they just walk on by? Like, they're just like it, and like, you should have held that door. For, like, I want to punch them in the face sometimes. I'm like, dude, I just held the door for you. I just risked getting COVID because you passed within two inches of me, holding the door, being polite, and you're just like, you don't even exist, person. Like, isn't that a terrible feeling? You ever do something nice for someone they don't even notice? I'm going to be honest, guys, there's times where, where I'll go home, and, and Megan will have cleaned the house nice for me. And I'm, I'm typically like a negative person, um, so I always notice what's wrong, but I don't always notice what's right. So I'll get home, and the house will be clean, and I won't even say anything. And like, I love a clean house, but I don't thank her in that moment. How do you think that makes her feel? Rejected. Probably like, why did I waste my time clean? He doesn't even appreciate it, right? Guys, it's a terrible feeling when people aren't thankful when you've done something for them. We've got to give thanks. And then it says to do what? To call upon his name. Literally just calling out his name. The guy who was up here, who was the youth pastor before me, Darren Bennett, bald head beard, he used to always do this thing where he'd say, tell everyone, hey, lean back in your seat and say, Jesus. And then you guys would go, no, you would lean back in your seat and you would repeat that, Jesus. 
And he did that for a reason. Why? Because there's power in that name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe. We're literally supposed to call out his name. But when's the last time in, in times of trouble, in good times, in thankfulness, in whatever it is, you just cried out his name? Because that's an act of worship. That's an act of praise. And then it says this, make known his deeds among the peoples. What's that mean? When's the last time you shared about God with someone? We're going to talk more about that next week, but that's an act of worship. That's an act of praise, making known his deeds among the people. Here's what God has done for you. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. He loves you. When's the last time you shared that with someone? You don't have to answer out loud, but that's an act of worship. That's an act of praise. Verse 9, it says this. I told you guys, we're not getting super deep here. I'm just reading the verses and then saying what they say. Verse 9, sing to him, sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Now, when we think of worship, this is what we're used to, singing. Anyone in here actually have the ability to sing? Guys, it wasn't a trick question. I was asking if you're capable of singing. Listen, I don't sing and it sounds good, but I'm capable of singing. Who in here is capable of singing? Every hand should go up. Now, I understand there are some people who don't have the ability to talk, and I'm not making light of that, and I'm not trying to to make a joke out of that. But for the most part, all of us can sing. Now, what comes out of our mouth and what it sounds like, that's that's iffy, right? (laughs) Right? When I sing, people run. It's this weird thing. Like, people are like, I run to the Father, but I'm singing. They're like, I run from the Sean, because it's bad. It's horrible. But what's crazy is it sounds beautiful to him. When you're alone in the shower and that song pops on your head and you're jamming out at home, and I don't, I don't even know what you guys listen to. I'm old. Like, I'm like NSYNC, and I, I don't even know. I just have random music. I don't know. But like a song comes on the radio. You're in the car with your friends, with your family, and it's like, just a small town girl. And then everyone's like, living in a... She took the midnight, right? Some people know this song. How about this one? Everybody, right? When when this stuff comes on, or does a song ever come on the radio and you're like, this is my jam. Hit me, baby, one more time. My loneliness is killing me. And I, I must, like, it's funny. When our jam comes on, we'll sing. But when it comes to this, when we're singing to him, even if it's not our jam, I'm going to be honest with you guys, guys, there's some worship songs where I'm like, I don't like this song. How stupid is that? I don't like this song that glorifies our Father in heaven. I don't like this song that brings glory and gives praise to God. This just isn't my song, so I don't worship to this one. Oh, but this song came on. How great thou, I love this one. This one's so good. This one makes me feel good. That's not what singing's about. It's not about me. It's about him. So do you sing at home? Do you sing in the car? Do you do these things? Most of you, yes, you're all capable of singing. But do you sing to him? Do you sing songs to him? Do you sing psalms to him? Guys, did you know that singing, singing spiritual songs, singing Christian songs is key to developing your brain properly? This is just science. Did you guys know that? You didn't know that. I got a picture here. This picture is of the human brain. This is actually my brain. I know that because it's really big. Just kidding. You would be able to see my brain right now if it were that big. So we're going to ignore the hippocampus because no one cares about that at this moment. But you've got your prefrontal cortex. Does anyone know what the prefrontal cortex does? That's where logic is. That's where you develop like your logical sense. Like you think in a logical way. So people who have a, people who have a really developed prefrontal cortex view their relationship with God very logically. Now, 
you got that other thing called the amygdala. Does anybody know what that is? That's, that's where fear comes from. That's where your sense of fear is developed. So I have a fear of, shh, 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 shh. I have a fear of snakes. That's, that's my amygdala acting up. It even kind of almost looks like a snake, right? Isn't that funny? So what happens, listen guys, this is just science. Between the ages of 11 and 16, you're losing millions upon millions of neurons in your brain that you don't need. And what's going to happen is one part of your brain, if you develop your prefrontal cortex, you're going to view God very logically. If you develop your amygdala, your faith is going to be based on fear. Maybe it's the fear that you're not good enough. Maybe it's the fear that you're not saved. Maybe it's the fear that how could God ever love me? Or maybe it is just straight up a fear of God. He's this God that I should be afraid of. But what happens is you got this thing called the anterior cingulate cortex. That's in between the two, and what it does is it acts like a seesaw. It brings balance to the force. It's like when Anakin kills the emperor and throws him down, and he dies, like when Darth Vader, if you guys don't know who I'm talking about, right? It, it brings balance. Now, it's important that we develop our anterior cingulate because what happens is it helps us to view God as a compassionate, loving father. It's not this logic-based view of God, but there's logic involved in that because we've developed our prefrontal cortex properly. But it's not this fear-based, I'm afraid of God, I'm scared he'll never love me because we've developed our amygdala properly. And it's this seesaw that brings balance to the two. So you view him in the right light. Now, do you guys know how you develop this? Between the ages of 11 and 16 is the most important. 10 minutes a day. That's all it takes. 10 minutes a day of spiritual singing, which for us is worship songs, prayer and meditation. Now, when I say meditate, I'm not asking you to go home and be like, I am one with Mother Earth. That's weird, okay? Please don't do that. Meditating is, is meditating on Scripture. It's reading it and focusing on it. It's, it's when I say, hey, sit and thank God, you can meditate on those things you're thankful for towards God. It's not weird like yoga stuff, like, hey, I want to line my third eye up with the, with, the, with the earth. Like, no, please don't do that. But 10 minutes a day of spiritual singing, of prayer and meditation. So here's, here's what we're going to do, guys. Starting Monday night at 8 o'clock on our YouTube channel. We put that up for you. If we can go back to that YouTube slide really quick, um, we're going to just stream 10 minutes of prayer and worship. And all we want you to do the next seven days, starting Monday night at 8 p.m., it's going to stream live on there. Uh, you just go on and you worship. You sing out loud. I don't want you to just watch, but I want you to sing along. Why? Not for me, but for God and for you. Worship is good for you. Singing is good for you. We sing songs to him. We're told to. So every night, starting Monday for seven nights on our YouTube channel, 8 p.m., we're going to do this. And then it says this. Sing to him, sing songs that, psalms to him. Verse 9 says, talk of all his wondrous works. Do you talk about what God is doing in your life? I want you to seriously think about that for a second. When you go to school, or maybe it's online, or maybe it's when you hang out with your friends, when's the last time you had a conversation with your friends about what God is doing in your life? When's the last time you shared about a work that he's doing in your life? When's the last time you talked with someone about what you're thankful for? Because you notice what it says here. It says, talk of some. Talk of a, a few. No, what does it say? Talk of all his wondrous works. So singing is huge. Coming to church, singing, worshiping, lifting our hands. I hope today at the end of this time when we worship and we worship a little longer than usual, that you guys will sing. That you'll sing. But also in small groups, we're going to ask you that question tonight. What's God doing in your life? Because we're commanded to talk about this. Why? Guys, because it's encouraging. We talked about this last week. You might be going through something that someone else has already gone through. You could talk about how how God has gotten you through it. You can encourage each other. But it is so, so important that we talk about what God is doing in our lives. Verse 10, we're almost done. It says, glory 
in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. This isn't super profound, but what's it say? Glory in his holy name. We cry glory. We sing glory. We glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. How do I do this in my own life? Do you guys seek him? Do you on a regular basis seek after God? Are you looking to grow in your relationship with him? I want to be careful how I say this, but in some ways, I almost want you to think of God as like your crush. And please, like I'm not trying to like say he's not holy. I'm not trying to say be weird. I'm not, but, but picture this. When you have a crush on someone, you'll do anything you can to try to bump into them. Maybe to, to, to brush arms with them. Maybe to talk to them. You'll try to get their number. You'll try to find out what they think about you. You'll try to text them. You'll, like, like you want to get to know that person. You want that person to notice you. So your waking moments are focused on them. I wonder what she's doing right now. I wonder what he's doing right now. Oh, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night. I'm going to sleep. I bet you he's going to sleep. We have so much in common. This is beautiful. Like, but your waking thoughts are just like with them all the time. Maybe you already have like a boyfriend or girlfriend, right? And you like text them and you're just so eager to see what the response is. You're like, I love you so much, babe. And you're just waiting. You see those three little dots on your screen. You're like, oh, they're typing back. They're just, I can't wait to see. I just said I love them. I wonder what they're going to say. And it's like, okay. That, that was your, no. But why is it like we have this like, excitement about a random person, but we don't have this excitement about seeking God. Seeking after him, getting to know him more, spending time in his words, spending time talking to him, spending time singing to him. Like, that is an amazing thing. That is an act of worship. That is an act of praise. And we rejoice. We seek him. We seek his strength. We seek his face. We pursue him. Yes, he pursues us, but we pursue him as well. And we do that for our whole life. I just went through a season the last like six weeks or so where I just learned so much about myself, but I learned so much about God. And it was a, it was a hard season. It was a refining season, but it was so good seeking him. I was excited every morning to wake up and, and just seek him and praise him and worship him. It's a lifelong journey and it's exciting it is so, so exciting. Verse 12. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Remember. We remember. That's an act of worship. Looking back on your life and remembering what God has done through the bad times, through the good times, through the ups, through the downs, through the roller coaster of life, that's an act of worship, reminiscing, remembering what he's done. Guys, it's so often the valleys that get us to the mountaintop. And when you look back and you see what God has done in your life to get you where you are today, and knowing that he who was faithful then is still faithful now, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and looking back on those things and remembering them, that's worshiping him, that's praising him. So when I look back at when my parents got divorced, and I see what God has done in my life, has done in my own marriage because of that, how serious I am, that that's not even a word in our home. We don't use the D word, divorce. Like, that doesn't exist in our marriage. God brought me to this place where I have such a conviction and such a love for my wife because of what I went through when I was younger. That valley brought me to that mountaintop. Through having an evil stepmom growing up who was emotionally abusive through my mom's breast cancer and melanoma and, and this great valley to seeing God healing her and, and, and using her to reach people who also are going through cancer and supporting them and loving on them. That's a mountain, uh, sorry, a valley that brought her to this mountaintop that grew my faith as well. When my grandma died, when my uncle took his life, like these, these valleys, these horrible things, that, that week when my uncle took his life, I got to preach the gospel that weekend in 678, and we saw over 30 kids receive Christ. 
So through one of the hardest seasons of my life, one of the hardest things that I ever went through, I look back on, and even though it hurts and it's painful, and I go, 30 souls were added to heaven from that valley. I remember what God has done. I remember how God moves. It says, which he has done. 1 Peter 5, 10, it's my life verse. It says, but may the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after we have suffered a while. It's after we've suffered. He will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. I love what Romans 5, verses 1 through 5 says. We'll throw them up on the screen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace which we stand and rejoice in what hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, what? Hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's what we have. That's what we remember. We have this hope. We cling to it, knowing that this valley called earth, this valley called life, leads us to eternal glory. And it's not something we hope for like, oh man, I hope I get this for my birthday, but it's a hope I cling to because I know it will come true. I know that after I've suffered, he'll perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle me. So what do we remember? What do we reminisce on? We remember the cross, the lowest low in the history of humanity. We remember that Jesus came and, and became a human, left his throne in heaven, came to earth, and died for us that he was brutally beaten, that he was mocked, that he was cursed, that, that he was spit on, that he hung there. He did that for us. We remember that. because Why? Because we have this hope that does not disappoint. We have this hope of eternity. We have this hope of heaven because of what he did. There's this character in the book of Genesis. His name is Joseph. And long story short, if you guys aren't familiar with his story, basically from a young age, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was accused uh, of trying to, to rape his boss's wife that he didn't do. He was thrown into prison. Like, it was trial after trial after trial for this guy who ends up becoming second in command in all of Egypt. But not only that, at some point down the line, you know who comes from his lineage? This guy named Jesus. Think about that. This guy was sold into slavery, but his life eventually leads to this family. I love how they word it in this thing I read. It says, there was this great famine in the land of Canaan, and Joseph administrated how to deal with food in this side. It says, if he never wisely administrates for this severe famine coming upon the region, then his family back in Canaan perishes from the famine. If his family back in Canaan perishes from the fam famine, then the Messiah can't come forth from a dead family. If the Messiah can't come forth, then Jesus never came. If Jesus never came, then you are dead in your sins and without hope in this world. We are grateful for God's great and wise plan. That's what we remember. That through all of it, God's got his hand in it. And we worship him and we praise him. Verse 13 and 14, we'll close with this. Worship team, you guys can come up. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Look at this, guys. We're his chosen ones. Why do we worship? We're, we worship because we're his. We sing because we're his. We sing because he's our shepherd, he's our God. We lift our hands because he is our God, he is our king, he is our savior. But more than that, it's just not us. Verse 14, he is the Lord our God. That is who we get to worship. So let's do that tonight.